Welcome everyone around the globe for today's webinar presented to you by the International College of Prostodontists. Our presenter today is Thomas Salina. Thomas will be talking about contemporary maxillofacial prosthetics for the world we live in. Thomas is a professor and chair at the Mayo Clinic Department of Dental Specialties in Rochester, Minnesota, United States of America. Thomas is also the president-elect of the American Academy of Maxillofacial Prosthetics. So it's a great honor to have you today, Thomas. Thank you, Our Dr. Our panelist today is John Wolfart. It's another great honor to have uh, one of our leaders in orofacial maxillofacial prosthetics. Uh, John is a professor emeritus from the Division of Otolaryngology, Head and Neck Surgery at the Department of Surgery, University of Alberta in Canada. Uh, John is also a life member of the ICP and is a previous member of the ICP Board of Consulars. Our other panelist today is Ami Schmidt. Ami is from the Department of Prostodontics at the Hebrew University School of Dental Medicine in Jerusalem, Israel. Ami is also a member of the ICP Board of Consulars and he's currently the chair of the Professional Relations Committee. I'm Limo Avivi Aber. I'm a prostodontist at the Faculty of Dentistry, University of Toronto, also in Canada. I'm a member of the ICP Board of Consular and I'm currently the chair of the Finance Committee, the Online Education Committee, which I'm organizing these webinars. And I'm also the chair of the Research Grant. Uh, if you are not a member or if you need to renew your membership, remember there's lots of benefit to be an ICP member. Uh, the International College of Prostodontists is the largest international organization. With the ICP membership, you get the Journal of the International Journal of Prostodontics, uh, which is also a great journal focusing on prostodontics. And there's other benefit that you can look on the ICP website. A great benefit is the uh, grant, ICP uh, research grant. The most prestigious one is the Ivoclar Viva Dent ICP Research Fellowship in Restorative Dental Materials. Uh, it's a month $40,000. Uh, it is available every two years. It's a peer reviewed. And uh, I encourage you to join the ICP and try to apply for and win this grant. We also have small grants amounting 1,000 to 4,000. These small grants meant to encourage young prostodontics, uh, including uh, prostodontic residents, uh, to pursue the research, either to start or to finish the research. These fellow, these grants, small grants, come with a, a travel award uh, to attend our meeting. The award is one thousand dollars. Also, for those who are ICP members only, or those who become members, you will have access to past recording. Uh, presentation that are not available to all to non-members. Uh, you have presentation by past by current president Srini Bakoka. Uh, there is also presentation two hours presentation on occlusion by Charlie Goodacre. There is an excellent presentation by Terry Walton on occlusion, and there is also a presentation by Frank Muller. All are very world renowned prosthodontists. So I really encourage to. Uh, log in to become a member and you have this privilege as many other uh, recordings, not only these ones. Uh, mark your calendar for the ICP meeting in 2021 in Shanghai. We're still planning. We are very optimistic. We hope we will overcome this uh, COVID crisis. Uh, so we are still planning. So please mark your calendar and we hope we have uh, the opportunity to meet old friends and new friends. I appreciate your kind introduction once again. I trust all of you can see my screen uh, well. Um, I'd like to also thank Dr. Schmidt and Dr. Wolfhart for their oversight on this program. I'm very honored to be with you today. This is a, certainly an unprecedented time that we're all experiencing, needless to say, but I trust all of you remain safe and well. Most of the topics I'll be discussing today will, will touch on some traditional maxillofacial prosthetics and its practice. Uh, for years past, this is uh, perhaps one of the older parts of dentistry that has changed, especially more recently. And those of us that practice this science know that uh, we never really accomplish any of this ourselves.
some of the work that uh, we uh, we muster between ourselves is from our prosthodontic consultants and our dental assisting teams. Uh, these keep us oiled and stimulated from a day-to-day -day basis, and it makes uh, it makes our work exciting. I'm very fortunate to practice in a large interdisciplinary practice, and it makes it makes for some interesting times and certainly some challenging but very stimulating experiences. Uh, most of our surgical colleagues have helped us tremendously over the years reconstruct these patients from not just the vantage point of disease elimination, but also from a uh, functional nature as well. So we're very indebted to our colleagues uh, in surgery and otolaryngology and oral and maxillofacial surgery and plastics and reconstructive surgery. Uh, our simulation specialists from radiology also make a, a, a tremendous impact and help us guiding these cases from beginning to end. Uh, so we're very, uh, we're very delighted to have uh, such a large intertwined network of, of, uh, of physicians and technicians that help us. I think in the last uh, probably 10 years, we've seen some amazing trends in the way that disease affects uh, a lot of us, certainly in the U.S., but certainly around the world. Uh, we've seen a, a jump in the amount of new cases of head and neck from uh, just even 11 years ago, uh, when I did a similar talk, I made comparison of 35,000 new cases. And now you can see that this is increased by approximately 60%. And much of this, as we all know, was related to a number of things, certainly increases in diagnosis, increasing the uh, uh, surveillance uh, and the abilities for us to, to allow uh, earlier diagnosis of these cases. But truthfully, a lot of this comes from uh, the epidemic, as it were, uh, from human papillomavirus. Most of us know about this. HPV-16, HPV-18 also uh, create uh, uh, significant conduits for uh, head and neck pathology and uh, genitourinary pathology. But suffice it to say that this is uh, an alarming rate of increase. We see it in younger age groups. We see it in people that may have a uh, uh, lack or, of thereof of symptoms. But uh, the, the observed to expected ratio of these cases is truly alarming. And we're trying to get a handle on the disease, even though uh, some aspect of immunization has been uh, probably influential, it's too early to determine that based on the age growth uh, and what affects people of these, uh, of these ages. So HPV certainly is, is a contributor to this. And we see a lots of ways of, of uh, concurrent treatment that have changed over the years as well. Surgery, radiation, and chemotherapy have been the mainstay of treatment for years, but there have been recent changes with regard to the way that we stage tumors, staging some of the more advanced tumors that are invasive uh, into resectable and non-resectable stages involves perhaps multimodal therapy, where perhaps even all three modes of therapy are used uh, to eliminate disease and control its, its progression and, and recurrence. So we're seeing a lot in the way of changes with approaches to surgery and uh, reconstructive surgery, certainly. Radiotherapy is another area that we're looking at uh, some significant changes more in recent years with the use of conventional radiotherapy. Uh, certainly, we've come a long way, even in that regard, from years ago with Fletcher uh, and colleagues at MD Anderson. We see conventional radiotherapy affecting exit dose tissue uh, to some degree. And regardless if this is an adjacent to vital structures or not, we want to shield uh, vital structures behind these target organs. Uh, proton beam or charged particle therapy, as it's known, has become very popular in this regard. And it allows uh, really confined treatment without any consideration of exit dose and uh, more or less a, a better control uh, especially so adjacent to vital structures, and especially so for developing patients. So proton beam therapy has been very popular in uh, certainly in years. Uh, it's been around for some years, but uh, we're finding that this is more helpful for patients that have had neck tumors. The effects of radiotherapy, uh, many of us know, we see this every day. Robert Mark classified radiotherapy injury as one that had a hypoxic, hypocellular, and hypovascular nature to it. There are a number of other uh, aspects of, of histologic changes we see. We see uh, perhaps endarteritis, we see soft tissue necrosis, we see pulpal fibrosis, 
We see basilar splits of cementum against dentin. And we see, of course, an increase in caries rate. And ultimately, uh, in some spontaneous cases, we'll see osteoradian necrosis. Now, treating this is, is, is quite difficult, but the effects of radiotherapy can't really be underestimated. Uh, this hasn't really changed, uh, depending on the source that we read, it really has not changed the incidence of osteoradian necrosis, but hopefully with some of the collimation techniques, shielding techniques, and other techniques of confining exit doses, perhaps this will change in years to come. Radiated wounds are certainly a consideration of head and neck reconstruction. So are many other oral defects, such as those that occur congenitally, like cleft palate and cleft lip, uh, patients that have acquired defects, uh, acquired defects from either trauma, radiotherapy injury, or uh, certainly disease or tumor ablative surgery uh, are other reasons for, uh, for these oral defects. And treating maxillofacial defects has its own set of challenges. We see a number of our patients that are afflicted with swallowing difficulties, with speech difficulties, uh, with mastication difficulties, but many approaches have been used historically to, uh, to address these issues. Classically, with cleft palates, we see that many of our patients have, have some mobility with the remaining segments. This isn't always true for every case, but there's always a dilemma about joining this versus non-unionizing uh, prosthetic reconstructions. Surgical reconstructions certainly are, are uh, targeted at, at joining these tissues, but if we really think about it, is it necessary to do so? And I don't think that we can really say for sure in every case what this is like, but uh, the approach to cleft palate therapy has changed also. With current techniques of nasal alveolar molding, these patients are being treated probably in a more deliberate fashion to align these segments in such a way that allows uh, surgical repair to be easier and less debilitating in the long run, better facial form and uh, more acceptance by, by patients and families. Some of our adult patients that still require this therapy have also in their own way acquired tooth loss and dysfunction from uh, natural teeth. For instance, this gentleman who presented to us some years ago had uh, failing dentition adjacent to a uh, largely an unrepaired, unrepaired cleft palate. Uh, reconstruction of this was targeted at making the segment separate. You can make the case for craniofacial anchorage here. Uh, we can also make the case the patient has sufficient native alveolar bone and was better treated with a reconstructive technique that was independent, yet allowing a conjoint reconstruction with a removable speech aid prosthesis. So these patients can present a, a challenge uh, in the fact of having complex defect um, uh, needs and it certainly in making them Traditional prosthetics isn't always an option. Uh, osteointegrated technology has changed a lot, certainly, of what we're doing for these patients. So very uh, interesting cases indeed. But if we really think about it, maxillofacial prosthetics is not all that different from conventional prosthodontics. We have a number of tenets that we use for removable partial dentures. Uh, rigid connectors, guiding planes, reciprocative clasping uh, within physiologic limits, but many of these cases really conform to where we can gain some element of reciprocation, stability, retention, support. These are all key factors, certainly for RPDs, and it's really no different for patients that wear maxillofacial prosthetics. Uh, in the maxilla, we're looking at uh, site Armani class fives that do have the ability to be stabilized, just like the patient we had just shown. Some of these become bigger challenges. Perhaps disease elimination uh, is indicative to remove either one half to 60% plus of the remaining hard palate. These are the cases that often do benefit from microvascular reconstruction and closure. Since attaining these tenets really isn't possible with an RMI-1 and an RMI-4 classification, for instance. Our colleagues, in New York, uh, at least at, at uh, Mount Sinai, have looked at this some years ago. Colleague Devin Okai and his surgical colleagues have looked at reconstruction versus obturation. What's appropriate? Surgical reconstruction certainly is indicated, as he felt, 
for midline defects or those that were greater, class one and class four are money defects. Uh, it's not always syndicated uh, for these cases with surveillance, for instance. We're always concerned about recurrence and surveillance of these patients becomes an issue where a flap, an osseous flap, uh, uh, precludes examination by the patient uh, periodically. We still need a prosthesis, however. There's no real substantiation that fixed is better than removable, but our patients definitely seem uh, to function better with a secured type prosthesis uh, when the defects are considerable like this. So some, uh, some agreement as far as the literature is concerned. If we look back to the history of maxillary reconstruction, we can see uh, some of this came also from the New York area with Cordero and Santa Maria. Uh, vascularized reconstruction of the maxilla or maxillofacial area uh, was targeted at closing this area at the time using a radius, which has a high degree of morbidity, but other tissues have since been demonstrated to be effective as well. So mid-facial defects of like this have been discussed at, at length uh, to consider what reconstructive approach is, is really beneficial for the patient. Is it one that just contains soft tissue or is it one that includes osseous tissue for osseointegrative rehabilitation as well? Just a few short case examples of maxillofacial reconstruction. This is a patient seen some years ago who uh, had what was called a calcifying epithelial odontogenic tumor. That occurred after incidental finding on a, a CT. The patient had an auto accident and uh, was evaluated by CT and this was an incidental finding. Uh, so resection of this was of course necessary and a subtotal resection of a left infrastructure maxillectomy was used for this patient. Reconstructive approach was to close this area using uh, vascularized fibular tissue and uh, this afforded some degree of soft tissue closure as well as osseous reconstruction. This gentleman was in his 20s at the time and uh, his reconstructive approach was uh, was pretty standardly accepted. I seemed to do very well with this combination screw retained cemented type metal ceramic restoration. Some of our patients still with tissue transfer of this type have difficulty with a uh, hair growing uh, beneath this full thickness flap. Uh, and this has been uh, a bit uh, of a difficulty in approach using uh, both electrolysis and even laser therapy. Another case whereby a patient uh, undergoing some rehabilitation after a, a large maxillectomy, uh, almost a total maxillectomy involving the orbital floor uh, and infrastructure of the maxilla as well. This patient had difficulty with opening some trismus and inability to wear an obturator prosthesis. A surgical team felt it was appropriate to use a, a iliac wing, um, via the deep circumflex iliac artery to reconstruct this area, allowing the patient uh, complete function and uh, uh, the avoidance of use of a, of a removable type prosthesis. Through, through many steps, this patient did very well, uh, having some elements of a fixed reconstruction uh, and soft tissue transfer with the DCIA. The patient was able to, to function and swallow and speak uh, very well. So, this type of approach for uh, infrastructure or total maxillectomy certainly is, uh, is, very, is very helpful. Another case involving an avascular necrosis injury uh, following elective uh, orthognathic surgery. Uh, a young woman had unfortunately sequestered her maxilla after this uh, was referred to us from another institution. A uh, patient had undergone uh, several attempts at hyperbaric oxygen that were futile uh, to reconstruct and to revascularize the maxilla. So uh, considering what was needed for this patient, the vascularized reconstruction seemed to be the right approach. With our radiology and imaging and printing area, we had uh, looked at advanced reconstruction using vascularized fibula for this patient, along with some soft tissue transfer as well. I was a very young patient, so uh, again, cases like this, the stakes are high with regard to aesthetics, with regard to uh, outcomes and expectations. Patient did undergo uh, resective and reconstructive procedures using vascularized tissue from the, from the fibula. 
this was accomplished with some in-house imaging and uh, printing 3D model guide for hardware reconstruction that assists this vascular element of reconstruction. The patient did uh, primary reconstruction uh, first, and then subsequently in a stage fashion, she underwent uh, implant placement and a later construction of a, a metal ceramic prosthesis. So uh, more of an extreme use of the fibula segment, uh, very useful. This is a uh, certainly a, a very adaptable sort of, of uh, uh, osseous flap that we can use based on the amount of vascularity that it has. Every centimeter, there seems to be a perforator vessel and this can be uh, shaped in such a way that allows perfusion. Another case of uh, reconstruction showing a patient that underwent uh, anterior maxillary resection for mucormycosis. Uh, this patient uh, had a successful uh, treatment for uh, myelodysplastic syndrome using uh, bone marrow transplantation. She unfortunately sustained um, a maxillary defect after experiencing mucormycosis. So reconstructing her maxilla was a personal request by the patient. She had a removable prosthesis that was no longer working for her. So she requested uh, vascularized reconstruction of this area, at least something more secure. This was done in a, again, a stage fashion using a scapular wing, scapular tip. This was certainly uh, planned, uh, guided to some degree, um, but the use of printed models was very helpful, at least to get an idea of what volume of tissue would be needed for this patient. So over a period of about uh, 16 months, the patient was rehabilitated with not just the vascularized reconstruction, but also implantation into the primary segment and ultimately the patient's native maxilla. One of the areas uh, to the left of the uh, flap maxilla junction was not unionized. So it was really more of a thought of building the patient an entire arch prosthesis to stabilize this. Uh, anterior segment of bone. This was done using a, a screw retained metal ceramic restoration and uh, allowed the patient some degree of, of external fixation for this defect. Uh, patients had this restoration for some five years plus now and she's doing uh, just, just fine. Skeletal anchorage for these cases can be an advantage. Uh, this patient uh, presented to us with a small defect uh, resecting a verrucous carcinoma of the maxilla. Uh, so vascularized reconstructions for this can be used, of course, but it seems to be more of a, uh, an overkill situation. This has been approached with using skeletal anchorage or extended length implants into the zygoma and perhaps a local regional flap, such as a temporalis flap to close this area and subsequent anchorage into the dentoalveolar segment using an auxiliary implant. So making a segmentation of this, of this type allows the patient to function just with the quadrant of, of reconstruction rather than subjecting the patient to a microvascular procedure. This has also been done with a soft tissue flap from the uh, radial forearm, of course, but uh, this allows a local regional flap to do, to do the same job. The advantage to using skeletal anchorage certainly uh, uh, is, is far superior than microvascular reconstruction. However, there are some pitfalls to it. We see with this, even though this is encased in bone for the most part, that's certainly the intent. There seems to be some movement of these implants. There seems to be some flexure of the implant. And under certain circumstances, we might experience loosening of uh, securing abutment screws and this was the case with this patient over a course of a little over three years. So certainly these cases can be done in a conservative manner, but there are some considerations to, uh, to be cognizant of. Occasionally, looking at the remaining maxilla for some of our patients, such as this patient with a midline defect, uh, being treated for an adenoid cystic carcinoma, this was back in 2009, the patient underwent full course radiotherapy and chemotherapy and had some progressive loss of teeth over that period of time. At the end of it, we were considering using skeletal fixation and anchorage for him, 
just so that we would be able to uh, provide a prosthesis that was secure and supportive and retentive. So looking at the amount of infraorbital tissue that remains, intactness of the zygoma, and also uh, an ability to uh, provide additional anchorage elsewhere in this facial skeleton was one of the thoughts we had for this patient. So when providing skeletal fixation in the defect side and also the non-defect side, along with two auxiliary uh, uh, implants, we were able to provide sort of a combination prosthesis for this patient, both a fixed through preserve his occlusion and also an obturator portion to treat the exposed maxillary fistula. So this patient did very well with this prosthesis. It allowed him primary occlusal support without directly involving the, uh, the obturator portion. Uh, patient uh, managed to get the area clean reasonably well, and the original intent for this type of implant certainly was, was this, this sort of scenario for this patient. So use of skeletal fixation for these patients seems to be very, uh, seems to be in order and does a, a allow a significant uh, uh, positive outcome. Further, patients that are radiated uh, in the maxilla, the zygoma is certainly in proximity to the orbits and often it's shielded from the effects of radiotherapy. So implants, even in radiotherapy, patients uh, seem to do, to do quite well. There are some limitations of, of zygoma implants. Obviously, there's some flexure that we mentioned. Uh, there is where there is limited interarch distance. We want to be careful of the material selection and choice. Uh, often ceramics do not uh, do well in these circumstances, uh, and it's best to consider either resin or perhaps even consider segmenting the restoration in these areas. Some of our patients do benefit from this as well. This is yet another patient that underwent resection for uh, lymphoma in the maxilla primary. There was no defect created, so the patient was able to be treated with fix, but as you can see, there's a large inner occlusal distance here. And this allows certainly some resistance to deformation from the prosthesis itself, and it allows the patient some chewing stability without having to rely on a removable prosthesis uh, for this. Patient had done very well with this prosthesis as well. Some of the first work with osseous flap transfer to the head and neck had happened at, uh, at Sloan Kettering under the work with David Hidalgo. Uh, eight centimeter defects typically are uh, commonly encountered in resection of the mandible for tongue mandible type uh, control of disease. Many of these patients had undergone rehabilitation in the late 80s, early 90s by the use of vascularized reconstruction. Our colleagues there also had rehabilitated a number of, of these patients and their satisfaction in comparison to years prior with a deviated mandible, difficulty controlling secretions, um, was a vast improvement over traditional techniques of rehabilitating resected mandibles. So this sort of uh, approach, even though it was hallmark at the time, had really uh, grown to popularity in the years to come. But if we think about it, we're asking quite a lot for this linear bone. It's a tubular shaped bone, it's a long bone, it has a straight profile to it, but we're asking it to do something that the mandible is quite, quite different. The shape of the mandible in this area of the jaw is bayonet shaped. It has one portion for the alveolus and it has another portion for basal bone. That's particularly true for the posterior mandible. So in many cases, we're having to translocate our occlusal rehabilitation and our occlu occlusal reconstruction. So this creates some spatial difficulties. In the original phases of the reconstruction, we can see that even trying to correct this occlusally puts a significant amount of change with regard to angle correction of abutments, direction of oral prosthetics relative to the, to the anchorage base uh, into the bone. So we're asking quite a lot of these screw joint connections. And in some patients, we should anticipate this depending on the facial profile. In original work with this, we can see that there really is a two-dimensional approach. 
uh, some of the earlier work done with maxillofacial reconstruction literally uses templates, two-dimensional templates, linear templates that are being used to reconstruct lateral defects of the mandible, anterior defects of the mandible. And we see that after a period of time, perhaps a linear defect isn't too difficult to control. But where we're trying to reconstruct a significant portion of the anterior mandible, lip posture, posterior mandible even, these are complex three-dimensional defects. So looking at this long-term, we begun to, to explore the literature further. One of the first approaches to this was to actually use the occlusion itself in an attempt to mobilize the osseous segments. Dennis Rohner is credited with that in the literature back in 2001. He was one of the first to take a, what he called a prefabricated flap of vascularized tissue being fibular at the time and reconstruct an atrophic maxilla. So this was hallmark and it was very unique at the time being the fact of occlusal based reconstruction, allowing the segments to be aligned in such a way to place the forces that were exerted from the teeth directly over the bony reconstruction. So certain parts of this have blossomed into digital planning. Analog work like this is certainly exhausting. And the digital approach that we have in the years subsequent was, was expanded upon by a number of colleagues, including uh, Dr. Wolfart present with us today. Looking at this from an intuitive reconstruction at the time of reconstruction, so to speak, some of our cases are emergent and they require that. Some of our cases have more of a planned anatomical intervention, but are unguided. Some of our interventions involve both, digitally planned and guided, and true reconstructions from an occlusal standpoint, are we, we really have found to be most helpful. Lifetime guidance and navigation are certainly uh, exciting topics, but at this point, I think they're a bit out of reach for some of us. Uh, they are helpful. The, the term surgical design and simulation has been used by many, but coin for head and neck, uh, Dr. Wolfhard and his group at Alberta are credited with that. So if we look at how this helps us with head and neck reconstruction, there are a number of products that are certainly available even from vendors. Virtual surgical planning is a commercial product uh, that many of us are familiar with. We're able to take uh, pathology such as this, osteoblastoma in a young uh, female patient, reconstruct this using three-dimensional uh, data and approach proper placement of osteointegrated implants directly over the line of force application. So is this predictable? It certainly is. Is it something that can be used clinically to give us a predictable result? We certainly think about that when we're trying to restore aesthetics, uh, patients that are very young, with delicate skin and uh, symmetry is really critical. Again, high stakes like this. So this young woman was reconstructed sometime, sometime back in 13. And uh, to this day, she maintains good symmetry, uh, good swallowing function, uh, and an overall good result. Uh, again, this was based with surgical planning. So uh, I think this really gives a testament to our, our goals long term. More recently, we're looking at classifying defects of the mandible, at least. Many of these cases have a specific mode, uh, a specific dimension of resection. Some of our cases will involve certain pillars of the jaw, so to speak, one being the canine tooth and the other being the uh, retromolar area. So there are standard ways of classifying these defects. This was recently approached by Brown. Uh, many of the, the attempts to classify mandibular defects previous were not evidence-based and did not really lead to much in the way of classification for, um, for outcomes. Classifications are, are broad here, but uh, suffice it to say, many of these are segmental and are based on these pillars of segmentation of the mandible. Uh, some of it is based upon vascularity. Uh, some of these require one or two segment osteotomies, some three uh, segment osteotomies. Uh, there are subclassifications of, of each of these that involve taking of the uh, ipsilateral condyle for disease control. And sometimes this is necessary. Some of our patients have emergent uh, needs for tumor removal, like this gentleman 
who presented to us with uh, a need for uh, removal. This was a large osteosarcoma. This gentleman did not have access to care in his home country, and he came to the clinic looking for the solution. So this was a very, as you can see, a very large tumor involving one temporal mandibular joint and near close to the other, uh, to the other side. So intuitive reconstruction in these cases does make sense for a variety of reasons. Uh, holding landmarks, bony landmarks particularly, is difficult even with planned resection. And when pathology is this large, it's very difficult to predict on where uh, tissue removal will be uh, confined. So reconstruction of this patient with multiple uh, vascular flaps was accomplished using radial forearm exteriorly and multiple uh, vascularized fibular segments intraorally. So this patient continued to do well uh, despite the extensive disease uh, along with his systemic therapy that he experienced. Some of our cases are, again, perhaps extensive disease and require some advanced planning and forethought. This young woman presented to us years ago with a need for multiple segment reconstruction of her mandible based on osteomyelitis that was uncontrolled. She was treated for some eight years previous to this with intravenous antibiotics, curatage, subsequent tooth removal, but was largely unsuccessful. This was some element of osteomyelitis, and she was given the option for surgical resection and vascularized reconstruction. Along with our surgical colleagues, uh, this was put into a simulation and basically plan for virtual reconstruction. And again, through the advent of printed models, we're allowing our patient to uh, present to the OR with advanced planning already in place. Our goal was to give the patient the reconstruction at the time of surgery for several reasons. Number one was to preserve her aesthetics and also to aid the reconstruction hardware in a two-plane reduction of, of the bony segments. Since these were multiple segments, uh, there's a higher risk of necrosis and non-union with these. So it was felt that the reconstruction could provide just that. In an analog fashion, we had used the printed model to make us a, a surgical prosthesis with reduction bars at the time of surgery. And this allowed concomitant reconstruction. We can see an external fixator in place here on the inferior border of the mandible. We can see the multi-segment uh, flap uh, where our implants have been placed. This was also planned and guided with uh, cut and osteotomy guides. And we can see the specimen that was removed and how moth-eaten the bone appears and uh, the coronoid process taken along with the specimen. So after reconstruction, a conversion prosthesis both used to stabilize the bony segments, ultimately to support the patient's lips during her convalescence, and to provide for some uh, light intermaxillary elastics uh, was, was needed for this, for this rehabilitation. Some months later, the patient underwent uh, reconstruction using a metal ceramic prosthesis. She continues to do well uh, with her mandibular prosthesis. So how is this compared to intuitive versus surgical design and simulation approach? Is it really worth it to go through the extra, extra steps of fabricating perhaps a printed model, uh, perhaps cut guides and this sort of thing versus having this done intuitively? So we began to look at the first series of patients in our practice and our surgical colleagues, and it saved them on the average of about an hour, a little over an hour for operating time. And at $180 per minute, um, that's probably worth it, uh, depending on where we all work. But uh, the cost of operating rooms these days is, is, is changing as we speak. And if we can save any time in the operating theater, I think it's certainly, certainly worth it. So looking at it further, the time taken from uh, reconstruction to the definitive prosthesis for these patients was almost six months. And we can see that just even the, sh the small, relatively small sample that we have uh, in our patients that underwent intuitive reconstruction in comparison to those that underwent 
surgical design and simulation reconstruction, you can see a savings of about almost six months. If we look at it further from implant placement to definitive prosthesis, the same subset of, of patients underwent probably a savings of a few months of, uh, of surgical time and definitive uh, prosthesis placement time. So there are some advantages, certainly, in our practice. Uh, we certainly want to continue monitoring our patient population to see if this continues to be uh, serving our patients well. So the complications that happen with these patients, uh, regardless of, of the technique used, we generally tend to see quite a lot of soft tissue hypertrophy with these patients, regardless if the patients are radiated or not, if the patients have been reconstructed with a mild osseous reconstruction, or if the patients have a skin paddle taken. And this can certainly lead to complications largely relating to soft tissue hypertrophy. Scar contracture is another one that we'll talk about, but many of our patients that uh, we have surveyed, looking at even this short subset of patients, uh, the majority of them have been reconstructed with porcelain fused to metal restorations and the balance lesser uh, with metal to resin uh, and a small mix of copings and zirconia patients as well. Time of follow-up, these the vast majority were well over two years. And looking at the most common type of complication was soft tissue hypertrophy. Now, many of these patients had an incidence of soft tissue hypertrophy that required intervention. And some actually underwent the procedure and some refused the procedure. So there is a significant number of these that are, I feel, underrepresented in this sample survey. But that seemed well over more than half the cases to be the most common type of complication experienced. How do we get around it? Well, in some cases, it's, it's beneficial to make a soft tissue bolster. This can be done at the time, even at placement, if it's sufficiently reduced, or at the time of uncovery, if, uh, if, if the surgeon is willing to, to let that uh, uh, happen postoperatively. We need about 14 days. And then we can subsequently fabricate uh, a definitive restoration after the soft tissue has been both dissected and translocated. So there are some benefits in using soft tissue bolsters in these cases. So what is the etiology behind this? Uh, we're not really sure, obviously. That's probably the number one question in this presentation today. What causes this? Could it be the type of tissue? Is it mucosa? Is it skin? Uh, dermis that's been transposed? Is it soft tissue stability, mobile versus non-mobile? I think these are all things that we tend to look at. Some of our patients have reconstructions whereby the reconstruction literally is outside the bony confines of the oral cavity, making it a real challenge to be able to manage not, not even the soft tissues, but also the implant site exit. Some of our patients have such a bacterial load. This could be due from radiotherapy. It could be due from prosthetics. There's a number of, of papers that have looked at this, but I think the consensus is certainly the bacterial load has changed as well in many of these patients. Sometimes it's patient specific. Certain patients may access cleaning differently than others, and it may be more related to, uh, to that and dexterity and location. Scar contracture is something that we've begun to see in our patients. In this population of patients, you can see the patient presented back for a mandibular reconstruction for uh, carcinoma uh, back about uh, a little under 10 years ago. Subsequently, she was uh, fitted with a metal ceramic restoration that was revised twice during the period of about six years. And then uh, she began to have advanced contracture and was finally seen for reconstruction again at, uh, at, at just last year. Uh, unfortunately, there was not much interocclusal dimension and replacement of the prosthesis was not possible. So some of these patients that have radiotherapy and some of them that don't still experience this type of scar contracture. This patient also underwent mandibular reconstruction and had progressive amounts of scar contracture related to just the reconstruction itself. Again, another patient exhibiting this over a period of, of two to three years. Um, over a period of time, we lose soft tissue attachment. We may lose some bone in this area as a result of it, but many of these patients 
that undergo particularly radiotherapy uh, do have scar contracture progressively over time. So it begs the question, well, what sort of design of prosthesis do we use for these patients? Should we use metal ceramic? I mean, if we have to modify the prosthesis that much, perhaps that's not a good good idea. And, and I think that's true. I think many of our patients benefit uh, in, in many cases from a uh, resin to metal reconstruction. These can be made versatile. They can be cut back. They can be modified. Um, and many a times we're able to modify it much easier if this material choice is, is, is selected. So production of these types of complex prosthetics. We have some, some fabulous technicians we work with, uh, uh, local and elsewhere, that allow us really a great approach with this type of, of, of treatment. But is this contemporary? Many of these are done by hand. Some of them are done digitally. And our, our traditional digital platform allows us production, what we're familiar with, a clinical imaging platform. Uh, this is standardly accomplished. We basically give it to our dental lab. This is a single data set. We transfer it to our lab. We allow perhaps maybe a 3D model to be made, perhaps not a model at all if it's a single unit restoration. And a device is made from this. We're all familiar with this. We do this pretty routinely. In the world of, of head and neck reconstruction, we have a more complex situation. I don't know if this paradigm fits well, but we're asking a single person to accomplish, again, both of these tasks. And what's in much of the way of maxillofacial reconstruction, we have a combined set of data. And it's perhaps radiographic, it's acquired before the patient's ever operated upon, and perhaps some of it is acquired after the patient is operated upon. So multiple data sets allow us to simulate this in surgical design and exporting it as a file into production. This is a large amount of information and segmenting it and breaking it up into multiple segments for this type of reconstruction we feel makes the most sense. It's certainly time consuming to do this, but there are certain types of uh, expertise that are available now to be able to do that. So the thought is in, 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 our, in our operatories and in our uh, clinic interdisciplinary aspect, we're looking at a combination of work between both the surgeon, the restorative dentist, a design simulationist, and an imaging specialist radiologist. This works well together. It allows this type of collaboration behind the scenes to produce essentially a manufactured type of prosthesis or perhaps printed models or cutting guides, et cetera. But these can all be used by simple segmentation of, of the data sets. So that's the, that's the thought. Much of our colleagues work in Alberta have shown this. They have a master of science uh, amongst some other universities, but uh, this is certainly an, an advantage in a comprehensive head neck program. What are the future directions for this? Well, some of our challenges have been jaw reconstruction and facial allo transplantation has been in the news a little bit. Uh, this was first done in 2005 from the Amiant group and uh, had focused at that time on just soft tissue reconstruction. But this has far been directed now to include hard tissue reconstruction and jaw transplantation as well. This young man presented to us some years ago with a ballistic wound, uh, missing at the time a large part of his mid face. He was reconstructed using iliac uh, crest as well as fibula. And even despite that, he still was missing a good portion of his mid face. His difficulties remain from certainly aesthetics, appearance, some function, inability to chew foods, and uh, overall, integration back into society. So after approximately eight years, he was considered for facial allotransplantation. And uh, when the time came for it, a donor was, was identified, uh, a young man um, uh, that uh, was found to be a, a reasonable match. He was also uh, prepared for dissection and the transfer of the organ was to include both a maxilla as a Lafort II 
and the anterior portion of his mandible with all soft tissue of the face. The organ was harvested and uh, attention was paid uh, in the recipient to doing just the same, identification of the facial nerve branches. And he was allowed uh, to uh, convalesce over a period of privacy, certainly. But during this time, the reconstructive team really wanted to focus more on not just an anatomic reconstruction, but a neurophysiologic one. And this patient underwent approximately 52 hours of operation using surgical design and simulation here uh, act that the transplanted tissue could be fit in such a way to allow it proper soft tissue extension. Uh, this was produced with surgical design and simulation. And uh, the patient underwent subsequent minor procedures involving soft tissue and actually convalesced reasonably well. After a period of two to three years, you can see this is the before and after 3D CT imaging. Patient underwent some minor dental treatment during this process in the yellow transplanted jaws and had reasonably good facial animation. Even though there's some asymmetry to, uh, to his facial form, uh, this is a pretty reasonable reconstruction and aesthetically pleasing to the patient. I can tell you it definitely changed his life, had a different outlook on quite a lot of, of everything. His facial musculature is, is well toned. He can speak well. He functions essentially normal. And uh, he, uh, he is on anti-rejection drugs, but has done extremely well over this period of time. So surgical design and simulation is certainly uh, an improvement of spatial relationships and treatment time. Uh, the fibula flap amongst other facial flaps is, is a, a very rapid reconstruction and is a very dependable one based on its vascular supply. The infrastructure needed to accomplish this is, is certainly cost effective. Uh, depending on the nature and the practice of where you're operating, it can be used as, in vendor support. Uh, uh, we've done a bit of both with both vendor support as well as uh, creating some of it on site, uh, but it has been uh, some growth over the period of, of years. I'd like to thank you for your attention this afternoon and I'll certainly open it up for questions. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas, for your excellent, amazing presentation. We will now open the platform for questions. So please, attendees, if you have any question, you can uh, type it down in the window of question and we will read it. Meanwhile, if Ami and John has any question, um, we can start the discussion. I do, I do have a, a question uh, to start with. First of all, Thomas, it's very impressive. And uh, I always say when I see these cases that you guys have uh, a place beside God for what you're doing for such patients. So thank you very much for that. Um, there's always a question whether a fixed one, uh, the fixed uh, versus the removable uh, obturate or replacement, uh, which is better? And I would like you please to elaborate on that as people do have some difficulties to clean around this uh, huge uh, reconstructions, especially when it's, uh, you know, um, screwed and uh, it is your restoring a large piece of jaw. And so I would like to see very much uh, what is your opinion about it, uh, uh, which is better the fixed or the removable. And not only in terms of uh, what's convenience, but also in terms of cleaning and maintaining the implants uh, uh, through the years. This is the first one. And the second question, which is tied to it, what is the survival rate of these implants? Uh, of course, um, I know that the disease is a problem too, but still about what is the survival rate of these implants? Thank you for your question. I think. Uh... I think some of this is related, a lot of personal philosophy, you know, 
making a fix versus a removal reconstruction. I think the, the first part of it is number one, are we, are we taking care of a tumor ablative defect? Is this a recurrent tumor? If so, what's the five year survival rate? The type of disease certainly is a huge consideration. If we're in the first 36 months of it, I think there is a risk of immediately reconstructing it and putting a flap and relying on imaging alone to determine a recurrence. That's one thing. So I think the way I could answer and qualify it would say, if it's going to be a recurrent tumor or the likelihood of it recurring is high, and if it's squamous cell, the likelihood is 52% survival. So, you know, those are high statistics. If we're around the a defect sufficiently and there's no local regional disease, perhaps it's a reasonable thing to do. If you combine therapy and uh, the patient has a mandibular continuity defect, I think it's reasonable to consider that for the mandible. For the maxilla, it's probably a bit different. I think some of our reconstructive surgeons do like to have a, a reasonable idea of what the survivability is before they commit to doing something fixed or removable. But we would like to have some aspect of surveillance with these patients. Now, if that means making them a fixed reconstruction and removing it periodically because it's screw retained, that's reasonable. Personally, I like to have direct visibility to it without having to do that. Many of our patients are reconstructed with fixed, but their survival is maybe T2 disease without neck extension, uh, and maybe they haven't been radiated. Those are the ones that we tend to focus a little bit more on fixed rehabilitation. As far as implant survival in these bone, I think it's quite different. I think you have radiated tissue definitely is about, probably about 60th percentile of survival of what you would expect uh, over five to 10 plus years. Depending on what you read, the most recent review by Albrechtson and Kranovic indicate that radiated bone has approximately about a 60% uh, survival with implants. So that's just one of the more long-term looks at it. In grafted bone, it may be even less. In autogenous tissue that's radiated, it could be less. So it's not very, it's, it's, it's not well known. There, there's a lot of anecdotal information out there that really is unsubstantiated. So there are some concerns with radiated tissue. It certainly is compromised bone. Even though it was placed in a vascular fashion, uh, it's still a radiated wound. And uh, the long-term survival of that is, is questionable. Thank you for that. John, please. I think we're muted. Yeah, it's muted. Okay, is that better? Yes. Yeah. Um, Tom, do you think in these situations, um, you know, from, from our dental minds with osteointegrated implants, we have learned to expect a very high um, level of implant longevity as a measure of success to accept them. But when you think within the, the surgical domain that we're functioning in with these things, uh, there's a very different view upon what, what the, the issues are that seem to be acceptable to proceed with treatment. And the variability is so much more than we ever live with in dentistry. So I became to wonder, in these situations where we're using the same device, but in a very different clinical environment, whether it's maybe closer to say an orthopedic model, where with some things you're living with a planned failure, but that doesn't deny the patient benefit. It just means you're operating very differently. We would love to have those very high successes, but with a good many people we've worked with around the world, they will deny the patient care because of their fear of not having the same level of success continually that you would experience in a, a, no, a more normal situation, if you want to put it that way. What, what are your thoughts on that? I think that's a, that's a brilliant way to look at it. I think what you and I consider, maybe in a rougher sense, what I was referring to earlier, you know, the implant survives, it's a success. 
if I have a bridge that stays in the position with good soft tissue, that's a success. But from a patient standpoint, patients don't understand that. They know that they have a numb lip and a numb chin. They can't feel a bolus of food and manipulate it like they used to. Their mouth is dry. They can't taste their food. So what you and I consider a success is not necessarily a success. And it is with caution that we perform these cases because patient-related and patient-reported outcomes obviously are how we will be judged ultimately on how successful we're going to be. And I've just showed you a few cases that we've done, but the bottom line is, how do patients perceive that? Is it the same model? Should we look at this standardly from a model of, as we say, replacement of just teeth, replacement using a prosthesis versus one that we know someday might need revision. It could be like a total knee. It could be like a shoulder replacement that will require modification. So like you say, you hate to deny the patient that experience based on that. But there are parts of the world where this isn't readily accessible. And patients, not every patient can have that done. The, the, the question in my mind is, if we have the ability to do it, is it, is it something that we have to advise the patient on? You know, even though you have a numb lip and chin and you can't mix a bolus of food like you used to, is it okay to do it or to try? And I think that that's the big question. We don't have enough information out there. There are some organizations that have looked at this, but the bigger measure of success is not what you and I do. It's what and how our patients perceive what we've done. So... Maybe that isn't answering your question directly, but... Uh, no, no, it is. It's all part of it. And I, I think um, uh, that's one of the things you, you're touching on that is so critical. And that is, with these new digital procedures, the lead-in to the time of decision-making for the patient and for the team for long-term consequence is very rapid now. It may come down to a week or two at best. And during that time, I think patient education and full disclosure, really good communication is absolutely critical so that everyone understands that the, the risk for morbidity and beyond is as well understood as is possible to transfer at that time. Uh, and that we are working, I believe we're working with very different outcomes that we have arrived at that are so different from our traditional dental paradigm of outcomes. And the tolerance of variance was certainly something over the years I'd adjust my mind completely with. So um, I, 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 think, I think what you're saying is absolutely correct. I appreciate that. I mean, I, I, I think it's, you know, all of us are trained to do prosthodontics in-depth dentistry. But at the end of the day, is that really all there is? And this model is very different because it's not traditional tooth replacement. And that's that's absolutely correct. But you know, Tom, yeah. uh, can I just add some? Yeah, yeah, sure, sure, go ahead. Um, you know, I'm, I'm trying to go to, maybe I'm nagging a little bit, I'm going to details, but you know, there's a lot of preparation for this procedure and then you're doing the surgery and you're providing the patient with a um, huge restoration. And for example, just, just to make, maybe I, I'm not in the business, so I, maybe I'm an, igno uh, an ignorant uh, with asking, but sometimes, you know, the, the soft tissue, which is not keratinized, not attached, and the patient is not able to clean around the implants and he's suffering from, you know, soft tissue, disability to clean you know i'm i'm trying to uh, to shed some light on these small things which are not you talk both of you are talking about the big picture which i i do understand that but you know the patient down the line you said to yourself there's a problem with it with the with the uh, numbness the bolus uh, functioning to learn how to behave with it how to function with it 
And then there are small things which can be itchy and make their life so hard. So I go back to the Brennemark days when they used to do, and John probably is aware of that, doing like a magnetic restorations where the patient can take a, a restoration which is magnetized to the implants, take it away, clean it, and then put it back. And this is what bothers me a bit, not about the restorations, which I salute uh, both of you for this uh, immense work and impressive, but you know, these small things which bother me. Yep, I think, I think the scientist in all of us feels that way. And I think it's by nature that we first do no harm, and secondly is to control disease. And even though patients may be numb, they're not aware that they have periimplantitis, periimplant mucositis, the bottom line is it's not health by our definition, and it, it, it bothers us a lot. And it, it may not bother them immediately, but we know that they will suffer the effects of it if we don't address it before long. So I agree. If, uh, may, I, may I comment? Yeah, sure. Um, so I think, um, again, a different paradigm of care in that uh, Tom had touched on some of those, um, those uh, tissue healing stents. Uh, the one thing the group in Edmonton learned, and they've gone further since the time I, I left there, is uh, I think one has to think of it again as a progressive control of tissues at the time of surgery through the oral rehabilitation phase. So using tissue healing stents becomes very important. The way the surgeon prepares the tissues is important. Um, the, um, the use of interim prostheses, so you're not, com you're not committing yet, uh, and you're watching to see where things go, and that can go on for a while. And then the final decision of whether you want to use a designer prosthesis that allows you to remove the uh, infrastructure section so that the patient can have far more access or going on to a definitive fixed approach later on. So um, the cost implications in care for that, um, but different health systems have different approaches to that. So I think um, our more linear dental minds see a very step to the end, whereas this is very much more a management of soft tissues. I'd like to ask Tom what he thinks of that, but just one other comment before stopping. Um, a couple of years back now, and it was 2018, I think, um, I was asked to examine a doctorate in Sweden of uh, Dr. Martin Johansson, looking at bone anchored hearing aids and skin response around the percutaneous uh, abutments. And he did work that I'd waited 20 years to see. Um, in this, uh, doctorate, um, one section looked at the, um, the microbial uh, events in the tissues around those abutments. This is, I think, very similar to see what we see in the oral cavity. And what they showed was certain organisms, especially uh, Staphylococcus aureus, take up residence in that, those tissues at the time of surgery. Some patients might have them resident in that tissue. And once they're resident, you have a heck of a time thinking you can get rid of them. And so we see these persistent areas in these patients uh, with uh, you know, percutaneous uh, connections in the mouth. And it, it really made, us, made me realize once again that long-term maintenance in these situations is essential. You cannot just put them in and expect that they're going to be there without any issue. And that's just another facet of that care. And we don't have answers for that even yet, but his work was absolutely fascinating and made me realize um, that one has to accept again that this is a long-term situation to manage these, these patients. And, uh, I found the, 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 one of the best things in those cases is using a CO2 laser, the most effective thing. And I think part of that was it was 
unwittingly we we were probably removing uh, some of that um, uh, microbial invasion into the deep soft tissues that is just sitting there and then causing chronic inflammation. So that's a long story. My apologies for that. But Tom, you can I ask you to comment on that? Sure. I think using a provisional restoration, <clears throat> as you mentioned, kind of it's non-committal. It allows several things. I mean, truthfully, it can be entry level. It could be something as simple as the cylinders and resin for a period of time. I mean, the, the amount of contracture we've seen with these patients makes it such that their lip posture is gonna change. Their occlusal dimension may change. And if that's the case, I think having something that is piloted will allow us at least some anticipation on designing it finally. So there are advantages in using, it's also a training device, if you will, for the patient. The patient knows that they have to clean around it a certain way. And you can design it and make it a certain way to where their dexterity allows that access. So the use of a, a pilot prosthesis, we found also, uh, is, is beneficial. We have no way of knowing that they'll have active lip confidence. I had one a few weeks back. I had to actually take out a few of his posterior teeth to allow him to close further because his lip was tight. And the only way I really knew that is with a provisional. So making a provisional, I, I think it can't be underemphasized. We've done quite a lot with that. It, it allows us to improve our work in the final prosthesis, but it also allows us to roadmap it and to give the patient an education to see what they can do as far as functioning with it and what they can do as far as cleansability. So I think there's a tremendous advantage in doing it. And I didn't show a lot of it, but, but I do, I do think that that's, that's highly important. Well, one other thing that uh, Ami touched on too is, um, I think that in the structuring of any uh, head and neck team today, um, uh, because our reconstructions are really in this, in this area of work directed at their functional reconstructions, that's the aim today. And to do that, uh, having, rehabilitation medicine involved right from the beginning um, uh, is, is absolutely critical and that the team have very good access uh, to functional assessment, measurement and outcomes. And I think uh, I would contend today from a maxillofacial prosthodontic point of view, uh, we cannot do our work without that um, input right from the beginning through treatment into long-term follow-up. It's you're working blindly without it. So uh, again, Tom, your thoughts? If, if I understand your question, maintenance, pre-thought, planning, and you know, follow-up with these patients, that's an important part, if I'm gathering it correctly. That's an important part of, of our practice as well. Some of our patient base travels and is from a distance. So we have to rely on the community to help us do that. And as you know, not all of the community is comfortable in seeing this segment of patients. So this is where our, some of our challenge lies. I mean, as we all know, this is the largest part of the patient's treatment experience, it's maintenance. I mean, all the preamble and the treatment and all that looks you know, it's, it's very interesting and as, as practitioners, we're very excited about it, but the bigger part of it is to transition the treatment to the community that in which they live. Or the other option is they have to travel for maintenance to us as well. Now, sometimes that's pretty straightforward for a patient to do, but we have to have the engagement. If they're being seen for surveillance, then it's not an issue. We do that. We do it in conjunction with our head neck team. If it's something that they have to travel for, for just us, that's not always. And I think having a plan in place for maintenance is, is important. And it's, it's not just important, it's anticipatory because if we see, you know, like the progressive scarring, you know, those are photographs taken of the patient clear on. And we pick that up because we see the patient regularly. And in doing that, we're managing the patient, we're managing their uh, their experiences, and we're trying to make that 
experience seamless. And I think that that's important, not just for the patient experience, it's for their safety as well. So what we've begun to do is incorporate our hygiene subdivision uh, to see these patients along with us and to provide that level of regular care, should it not be found in their own community. Oh, what I was also getting at there really is uh, from the point of view of, uh, usually it's within speech and language pathology that um, they are doing objective assessment of function. I mean, I think, I think today it is completely unreasonable not to have that functional assessment, those objective assessments of function following through from pretreatment into their long-term outcomes. And for the prosthodontist, I mean, it's again, to me, it's just um, central to the prosthodontist function to have that happening and to have that information to guide care that maxillofacial prosthodontists are doing. Uh, so, uh, you know, that's something that I was sort of trying to get at there. Absolutely, uh, you know, I, I was remiss in saying that, but yeah, our speech language pathologists definitely, for our tongue mandible defect patients, those, you know, all of our patients really, but but especially those that have swallowing difficulties, it may be isolated to just radiotherapy, it could be an anatomical defect. And some of our patients were able to undercover an underlying neurologic disease. So, you know, this is a, this is a very important part of our practice as well. Uh, I think it's underscored, uh, particularly when the patient is meeting with the surgeon for the first time. Uh, it's very important for them to understand that. And it's also important for them to understand the rehabilitative aspects of it as well. And once again, you know, we can discharge the patient. We rely on the community speech language pathologist to help us with that. But truthfully, if they don't work in a regular experience, like with our department, it's difficult for someone in the community to duplicate that. So I think it's integral that they see the same person. Outcomes assessment is, is a key part of this. And what's their expectation? Are they able to do what they did before? That's, a, that's an important patient-related outcome. You know, speech is one part of it. Swallowing is another part of it. Certainly so. I think with long-term survivals with HPVs, um, given, you know, the disease and where they have it, uh, and the and the age group of that, uh, it becomes even more critical today. So. Okay. Tom, but yeah. you know, uh, just uh, to uh, close the uh, this issue about maintenance and the uh, tissue around the implants, um, sometimes the resection is so extreme. And you are talking about rehabilitation of a uh, dimension which is below the floor of the mouth. Um, the tissue is usually mucosal. Are you able to put some, let's say, uh, uh, transpositional grafts of uh, keratinous tissue from the palate, for example, around the implants? Is it possible? Does it hold it at all? I think that the, that's a very good question. And even with the skill of the surgeons, you know, the problem with trying that is often that type of basilar tissue is highly mobile. And getting a graft to stay there without the old days of the vestibuloplasty, the old days of surgical stents that were held in place with circumandibular wires. And even those cases, it's very difficult to get tissue to, to stay in those cases because it's mobile to begin with, and it's very difficult. I haven't had much success in our surgical group with, with doing that. But yeah, that's always a concern. But particularly with the mobility, I think it's just really asking a lot. We haven't been too successful with that. One, one thing, um, here's, here's a thought for the future. Um, the, uh, the group at RSM, um, with uh, Martin Oswald and Suresh Naya and uh, the head and neck surgeons, Hedy Cycli and the team at the University of Alberta. Um, uh, Hedy came up with some very interesting things he does with the soft tissues, which uh, has really made life way, way not better. Uh, and using the art procedure, the, the evolution from the Rona or cancer cases. And 
I think that could, because the soft tissue problem is such an issue as Tom mentioned and showed in his data for everyone, uh, that would be, I think, a very nice webinar to have uh, some of that uh, evolution presented because I think it's very valuable work. We'll consider so, that. I have a comment regarding the uh, functional rehabilitation. Obviously, Thomas would can guess what I'm leading to, but I wonder if your physiotherapist or speech language pathologist apply neuroplastic principles of rehabilitation, because as it relates to limb rehabilitation, we now know that you have to follow a very specific principle in order to be able to maximize the uh, restoration of function. Because it's not just, you know, providing the prosthesis or just doing exercise, it's not enough. You have to apply principle that the brain can adapt adapt and not maladapt or adapt faster and better for longer time. Yes, definitely. I mean, uh, the case I showed with the large uh, young man with the large osteosarcoma, for instance, you know, that was, although I didn't show it, we made a, a large provisional restoration for him that was sort of a training device. He was without one joint. And he had a certain teardrop chewing pattern that was obviously altered. And what I did was we got him used to the rehabilitation with the provisional. And I used this provisional literally as a prototype to make the definitive. It had the same amount of overlap to it. Uh, you know, we made a custom incisal guide everything was duplicated with it and he was a very discriminating young man and uh that kind of affirmed what i thought as soon as i put the definitive in you know he was pretty accepting of it because honestly it was an exact copy of the of, of the provisional and i think i think that's one of the ways that we use again as yeah. a training it may be neuroplastic it may be just duplicating what he's already done but yeah. i agree i think making people neuroplastic it's no different than playing music i guess i wasn't a great trumpet player but that's yeah. another story. but yeah. but if you have neuroplasticity you can accomplish these things and yeah. i think that this is a definitely another answer to that and yeah. duplicating it as as you would with a training type prosthesis there's merit to that yeah no really certainly this is one of the principles but even exercise, I mean, sometimes even exercise, muscle exercise, uh, but for a long period of time, even not related directly to the missing function can facilitate the function of the missing function. Sure, sure. Yeah, yeah it's a challenge with many of these people. They, they obviously don't have, they have a large neurosensory defect. They have an insensate flap and they can't do literally what they did before maybe physically but they do have some memory some some osseo perception if you will and there's a way of hopefully evoking that and yeah. by helping them with exercise and this sort of thing i think that that's a reasonable thing to do but there there are tremendous advantages to oral physiotherapy for sure and i don't think we really hone in on that enough yeah i have some questions from uh, the audience yes uh, is sds method same as alberta technique well essentially yes that's what we're saying i mean surgical design and simulation uh is is if the three articles that i can think of um indicates that uh, uh john can probably answer that a lot better than i can so i'll i'll defer to him um yeah the, it's just a little uh, some terminology we're struggling with um the way that ev evolved in in the edmonton group um with establishment of the master's degree um surgical design and simulation uh it it really refers to professional designation and this new young professional group uh, that uh, are skilled uh, in undertaking um, surgical design. And uh, the, the, the actual plans they create are virtual surgical plans. And they initiate that process and then the whole team works on them. 
So, um, but the actual surgical technique that is that was developed and is used for cancer patients, as I said, is an evolution of the Rona technique. Uh, and it is referred to as the Alberta Reconstructive Technique, which is the, the acronym is ART, A-R-T. So uh, the surgical designer uh, and simulationist is the person, the professional, who initiates the, manages the technology and initiates the surgical design, which produces the virtual surgical plan and the technique used commonly in that group is the Alberta reconstructive technique for cancer patients. Uh, that explains the pathway of words. So we're, we're all struggling right now coming to common terminology, I guess, over the next while that might be clearer to everyone, including uh, how us. About the, uh, are you done, John? Yes. Uh, Tom, how about uh, this is something which bothers me and I've been trying to get an answer a week ago in the former previous uh, webinar. There are patients which are coming with, uh, uh, first of all, cancer patients who get some uh, uh, bisphosphonates, which actually complicate your surgery and complicate the ability to place implants. This is one issue. And another issue about the osteoporotic uh, patients, which also complicate your uh, ability to place implants. So how do you cope with that? This is, uh, they're actually related because there's both, and especially those who are getting uh, uh, intravenous uh, uh, bisphosphonates, which complicate the issue. And the, uh, and the, 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 the thing is of, uh, if you are using uh, implants or bone implants from other parts of the body, um, how predictable is that? Not only the implants. These are very good questions. I think I, I defer to my colleagues in endocrinology for these questions. Osteoporotic individuals <clears throat> certainly can be treated with a number of bisphosphonate medications, monoclonal antibodies, and other similar type of uh, denusumab, <clears throat> bevacizumab, these are all very commonly used to treat both in a way of preventing skeletal events in patients with cancer and also patients that are having reduced bone density. The dosages used to treat those with reduced bone density is honestly less of a concern because the dosages are, are, are far, far different. In patients that have um, prevention of skeletal events that are being treated with bisphosphonates. These are the ones that make the dilemma. Um, the half-life of these meds, is, as you know, is, is pretty big. So it does complicate uh, the fact of, of placing implants. Now, if the implants are being used to, to secure a prosthesis for, for swallowing, uh, for uh, securing a, a, a soft palate defect, uh, we make the case to do it. Is it a risk? Yes, it's an advised risk. If it's medically indicated to do this, we offer it to the patient under advised risk. Um, so, you know, for routine placement of missing teeth, yeah, it, it is a risk and it's maybe unwarranted. So we don't always offer that primarily to patients that for just partial edentialism or even complete edentialism. If a patient has a need for maxillofacial prosthesis, however, obturator, this sort of thing, speech bulb, uh, mandibular prosthesis, uh, replacing part of the, of the mandible, uh, that's a different matter. So, so it's under an advised risk, it's a calculated risk. But those that are being treated for bone density, our endocrinologists feel it's not as big of a risk uh, for MRO and chip. I have a question actually for John Wolfram. Um, what is, do you know, can you tell us a bit about the multidisciplinary maxillofacial prosthodontic work in Canada? Um, 
I think my understanding across Canada historically has been that it varies considerably from province to province because each province you know controls its own um, arrangements but under the the Health Care Act. So I don't think there is any one immediate model, but I think that it is if it was difficult before, it's now impossible to function outside of a multidisciplinary and preferably an interdisciplinary team. So what interests me as we move to this digital era now very rapidly, the makeup of the team changes very differently. Technology does not respect hierarchy. And so I think um, it's, it's a metaphor, a lot of thought and discussion, because there is a hierarchy of responsibility in the team. And yet with digital technologies, you have to function on a very flat structure. And the surgeon at the end of the day, living with that final responsibility, especially in these very, very difficult cases, has to have absolute trust in every member of the team. And it cannot simply be multidisciplinary any longer where you know the patient is the token pass between disciplines. There has to be a very, um, close working relationship that is seamless across the team in order to deliver the kind of result that digital technology offers. That means that the behavior within the team changes completely. Uh, it is no longer based on a simple hierarchy that we've known traditionally. It's very, very different. But when it works, it's wonderful. Uh, but not everyone wants to work in that kind of team. And so I think there's almost a predisposition uh, of individuals that are going to be attracted into that kind of activity. This produces a new situation for the prosthodontist because the prosthodontist has the broadest, and this is something Tom and I have just communicated on, the prosthodontist really has the broadest knowledge of all disciplines and procedures in the team. So it's a bit of a hub and spoke situation that if the prosthodontist really understands the role of the digital technologies and how they're deployed and managed, mm -hmm. then the prosthodontist has a completely new role to play within that head and neck team. So I think we're moving into, we're living in an awkward transitional stage right now. And it certainly doesn't mean jettisoning our known knowledge to date, but it means thinking quite differently into the future as these preferably interdisciplinary teams function. So um, with that, I'll stop because I think uh, I've said enough. Okay, thank you. There's one more question before we end the webinar. Uh, what is your opinion about PNAM? Cochrane Review says, it is not effective, but in my cases, I have found it to be very effective in terms of better align, aligning the segments and reducing defect size. From what I understand, and my colleagues uh, Brecht and, uh, and Barry Grayson with the technique, it definitely aligns. Uh, it definitely aligns the segments better than than if we were to assume that. We've got patients treated without it. I think I, I think that the ability to align segments prior to surgery, you know, anecdotally, you can make the case for it. And even though Cochrane, you know, this keep in mind, this technique is new. It's not been around that long. And for Cochrane to make the the statement that it's it's not been shown to change it, you know, we can go back. You know, Cochrane database is what our physicians use as uh, as <clears throat> really expert uh, and criteria to scientifically show that there are differences between one method over another. In 2008, uh, 2005 actually, I looked at a, a method of, of post-operative uh, extraction healing using hyperbaric therapy. And at the time the statement was there was no difference. And if you go to the Cochrane literature now, that's not the case. So with time, this may change. This is a very young science, and I think we know very little about it. 
And although, although anecdotally we see some great cases with that, um, there just really isn't enough yet to show that that's the case. Thank you. And before we end, uh, there's one question about, do you have any maxillofacial prosthetic uh, program at Mayo for internationally uh, trained dentists? At this time, we don't. Uh, you can certainly go to mayoclinic.org. Uh, there are opportunities uh, within for, at this time with COVID crisis, it's somewhat restricted, but uh, that isn't something that the university has closed its doors on. So uh, you can certainly look into that. Okay, so our webinar come to an end. Uh, thank you everybody for attending the webinar. Thank you, John, Ami and Thomas for excellent discussion and please join our organization. Uh, Tom, thank you very much. It was uh, fascinating as always to listen to you, but uh, especially in this field. And I wish you all the best. What can I tell you more uh, aside to the compliments for a very well comprehensive and excellent presentation. And it was nice to listen to you and to John's uh, comments to this and to uh, and Tom's uh, and uh, John's uh, addition to the uh, discussion. Thank you very much. I learned a lot. Uh, first of all, Vimo, I'd like to thank uh, you and, and the ICP for this initiative of holding these maxillofacial prosthetic webinars. Uh, I think it's just excellent. It's just a, a wonderful thing and I would encourage the ICP to put a lot of support behind this. And secondly, Tom, as always, uh, always wonderful to listen to you and uh, greatly enjoyed the presentation and information. I mean, wonderful to see you again. So thank you very much. Okay, thanks, Thomas, and thank hope to see you soon again. Yes, Have thank a great you very day. Much. Great thank day you. or great night. Bye bye. Bye bye. Do your best. <laughs>